Five. Well, thank you for coming out on a rainy day. Uh, this is going to be a discussion of the Internet of Things, how we manage the risks to privacy, to security, but also how we take advantage of it. And so the Internet of Things is the future, right? In fact, it's here now. And there'll just be more. You can, depending on which consulting firm you like, there's either billions, zillions, or trillions of IoT devices present now or coming in the near future. But one of the things that, that uh, I didn't like in a lot of the initial discussion was the heavy emphasis on uh, risk and danger, because what we really have here is opportunity, right? And so we need to think of a way as a society to balance risk and opportunity um, and do that in a way that hopefully doesn't uh, trip us up any more than is necessary. Um, let me introduce our panelists. We have a tremendous panel. I'm going to uh, not go down the row. I'm going to do it in the order it was given to me. Uh, sitting next to me is Malika Carroll, who's a policy advisor for Senator Brian Schatz of Hawaii. Um, she's helped build uh, government affairs teams for companies uh, for years. Am I allowed to say which companies? So I no, apparently not. Um, <laughs> developed policy and political strategies, built coalitions and advocacy campaigns, and worked with CEOs and others in the C-suite. Uh, her expertise includes technology, international trade, privacy, and intellectual property. She's also an adjunct professor at Georgetown and is the co-founder and former chair of the uh, Global, Women's Initi uh, Global Women's Innovation Network. Mouthful. So, pretty impressive. <laughs> Mouthful. Yeah, I know, I could barely say it. Uh, Second from the end is uh, Mark Einhorn, Assistant Director in the FCT FTC Bureau of Consumer Protection, the Division of Privacy and Identity Protection, which is particularly relevant for us. Mark joined the commission in 1998. He supervises privacy and data security matters. He came from the chairman's office, Chairman Leibowitz's office, where he was an attorney advisor on consumer protection issues. Um, he worked as an attorney in the Division of Advertising Practices and was an attorney advisor to both Chairman Leibowitz as when he was a commissioner and to Commissioner Leary. Um, he went to law school in Virginia, University of Virginia, I thought I should mention that, and clerked for the uh, Ninth Circuit. Uh, at the far end is Alan Friedman, uh, an old friend who has uh, worked at uh, more places than I can say, but is currently the <laughs> Director of Cybersecurity Initiatives at NTIA. Uh, he actually has a real degree, and that makes there's actual two technologists on this panel. That's amazing for CSIS. He has a degree in computer sciences, was a fellow at the Kennedy School's Belfer Center, worked before NTIA at George Washington University and at the Brookings Institution, and uh, has a decade of experience in cybersecurity. Uh, finally, last but not least, Brian Witten, Senior Director, Internet of Things, Symantec Corporation. Brian uh, leads an engineering, has led engineering teams on Symantec's endpoint protection, mobile, and reputation-based security for enterprise. He's helped create technologies used by Symantec and Norton. And uh, the fascinating tip, uh, he worked at DARPA, where he managed an R&D investment portfolio of more than $150 million before coming to Symantec. So that's a pretty hefty hunk of change. Now, I told them that we weren't going to do the normal talking head thing, that what we would do is open up with a few questions and see if we could get a conversation going. About halfway through, what I'm gonna do is open it up for uh, questions from the audience, so you should think about what you wanna ask about or what you wanna talk. Um, I don't know if you wanna just say something quickly as we go down the line. Uh, Alan, you were going to say something. I thought this is your official moment. <laughs> this right? is my well. So, so first, <clears throat> I can say in, in official capacity as NTIA uh, that NTIA has a request for comments out on the Internet of Things, uh, hoping to clarify <clears throat> or seek input on what the role of government should be, which is incredibly relevant to this discussion today. Uh, not, it is not specifically focused on security. It is focused on a wide range of issues. Uh, it asks, uh, I think. 18 or 20 questions, but really they all boil down to what are we happy about, what are we worried about, and what, if any, should be the government role in this? And I think one of the points to underscore is that security isn't just about explicit security questions. Uh, if you're concerned about government action, you may want to say, well, what should the government be measuring in terms of economic statistics? Uh, how should our international trade policy reflect IoT? 
when it comes to security and privacy. Uh, and so if you're interested in that, happy to give you more information. The comment deadline is due June 2nd. Uh, June 2nd, okay, great. Thank you, yeah, this is an opportunity for people to put in uh, some suggestions on how we might move forward. Let me start by asking the panelists, and maybe we can go down the row, um, how much risk is there in IoT, and what kinds of risk? Uh, what, what worries you the most? Is it privacy, consumer safety, something else? What's the risk that we're talking about here? So uh, I'd be happy to go first Good. on that. Um, one of the things that's unique about IoT is we're often talking about cyber physical systems where lives are on the line. But I want to go back to the comment that you made earlier. Technology is often cast as good or evil, but it's, it's really both. If I look at automotive, for example, right now fatality rates right now are about three per thousand. That's only a fraction of a percent per accident. Uh, so that's extremely low, and that's largely because of uh, you know, uh, collision detection, anti-lock brake systems, and a lot of you know, digital security, uh, side airbags, and all kinds of things that you know, we wouldn't have in a lot of cases without computing. And vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle and some of the other new technologies have a chance to bring that collision rate and the fatality rates even lower. But at the same time, that connectivity is a big risk. So if we just build in the chips and we don't build in the security, there's a real chance of those chips being used against us. I think most of us saw the videos last summer of car remotely hacked and remotely run off the road. And the people who did that said on stage last summer that it would have been easier, actually, to hack all of the cars of that brand and run them all off the road at the same time rather than just try to target one because the vulnerabilities were common in mass across all of the vehicles. And that's a common pattern that we see here. And that's why I think security needs to be built into all of these things. Uh, and they need to be secure by design before they come to, uh, to customers, whether it's a consumer buying a car or an enterprise buying the manufacturing equipment that might make cars or golf balls or anything else. I'll jump in on that. Um, I'm Mark Eichhorn at the FTC, and I'm just to be clear, just speaking for myself, um, that I agree with everything you just said. And, and you know, there's so many benefits to these products. I think that um, when I was growing up, there were about more than 50,000 deaths a year from car accidents, and now I think it, there's a number in the high 20s, um, so that's a pretty significant reduction. Um, but these products, particularly at the FTC, we're a consumer protection agency, so our concern is, you know, partly that consumers get the benefit of the bargain, um, and, you know, that these products not cause injury, basically. So we're concerned about the, um, the security risks of the products. We, have, we held a um, workshop a few years back um, on the Internet of Things, and we tried to get a pretty wide um, segment of people coming to the workshops, um, so like consumer groups and academics and researchers and trade associations and businesses. And one thing I was surprised about was that there was a pretty um, wide recognition from, from basically everybody on the panels that security was something that's not really being taken into consideration in a lot of these Internet of Things products. And as Brian mentioned, you know, unlike with computers, um, or at least with my home computer, I don't really have that much of a safety risk associated with it. But you can have physical safety, you can have, um, you know, internet connected locks or garage doors that also present sort of physical security concerns. And a lot of these devices also, I think a, a central concern is that um, even if the device itself doesn't need to be that secure, that if it's not secure, then it'll let somebody get into something else that they want to get into. Great. Well, um, from a con congressional perspective, and, and clearly I'm here to speak on my own behalf, not on behalf of Senator Schatz, but I think from a congressional perspective, what we've been trying to do is not decide what is secure and what, what's not secure, but really be in a learning mode and listening mode, and also trying to focus on enabling the technology. And so um, uh, the Senate um, has a working group on the Internet of Things, um, a bipartisan working group, and we've encouraged and supported NTIA's effort to do um, th the process that they're going through right now. We've also introduced legislation on IoT, and the purpose of this has been really to try to um, raise awareness amongst uh, staff and members, but also get a better understanding of what are the risks, whether it's through um, uh, a commerce-led initiative or GAO study. We've really been in a learning and lesson, you know, learning mode right now. So one way, rather than cataloging all the risks, I'm assuming that everyone here has sort of seen 
you know, something breaking. Hey, let's make our toilet smart. Hey, you can hack the smart toilet. Uh, but we can sort of think about patterns of risk. So one natural thing, well, let's just build stuff more secure. Uh, and from that, I think we have some lessons about the challenges of building secure software. You can build more secure software. You have to work at it. Uh, and it will lower the overall risk. So that's taking risk as sort of a flat distribution and taking it from here and taking it up to here. You'll still have a random draw, but we can reduce it overall. Uh, another approach is to say, what makes it different from a device perspective? And one of the things beyond just the fact that it's embedded is that the devices are going to be with us for a lot longer. Uh, so how many people have a garage door opener in their house or apartment or condo? Uh, there are no hands. Let the web test like there are no hands. So how many people know who installed Wait, that? We should ask how many people have a garage. That's <laughs> that'd be good. We can, uh, oh, good. So I think if you bought a house in D.C. in the past years, you don't know who installed that garage door opener. And that's just a simple click, click radio button. As more and more homes are built to be smart with features that are embedded and enduring, uh, how do we make sure that the risk is managed? Uh, whether it's patching over time or making sure that you, you know, depermission the previous user. So that's one way that you have the, the control in the tail. Another is this question of patching. How do we make sure that certain devices are field upgradable? Uh, or if they're not, how do we communicate that risk back to the consumer? that they're buying it, this is a one-off, there's no way to secure it. And uh, perhaps the final and the biggest challenge when we think about risk is the technical. Uh, where do we actually uh, manage the risk and control? I wrote a paper a couple of years ago called The Internet of Things versus the Client Server of Stuff, arguing that, in fact, most <laughs> devices that we're seeing at the moment aren't a true internet. We're not seeing a true network of networks with peer distribution. What we're seeing is a bunch of things that talk to the phone or that talk to the server in the house, and it goes up to the cloud and goes back down. Now, that gives us some good insight into patterns of control. In some ways, it makes security perhaps a little easier because we can say, oh, if everything's flowing through common sets of gateways, we can look there for uh, risk management. Alternatively, uh, if all the data is flowing up into the cloud, it makes privacy perhaps a lot harder to think about in a robust fashion to collect. I uh, should also at this point have added something. You can tell that I'm relatively new to the government, that I'm here on behalf of myself and not the U.S. Department of Commerce. The fact that I cited papers written well before I joined the government is an important indicator of that. I, I'm here for myself. I, <laughs> I might be the only one on the panel who can say that. But... Um, let me come back to the car uh, example, because we were talking about, if you look at the uh, original cars, they had no safety glass and wooden wheels and no seat belts, and the whole, they were dreadful, right? And over time, what we saw was cars got safer. So risk is dynamic, right? How do you think the risk on the Internet of Things will change? What will become more risky? What will become less risky. Frankly, every time I drive to work in the morning, I can't wait for those smart cars and when I see the people on the parkway. Um, so for me, risk will go down. But I don't know if you, anyone wants to tackle Maybe that. Maybe at the 10,000 foot level, one thing yeah. we've heard through the work we've done yeah. on, on IoT is a, a concern about conflicting regulatory guidance. Mm -hmm. And so to get back to your car argument, um, it's not just the risk of the technology, if there is some or if, it's, if there's more risk, but it's also how do we ensure that there is less risk through, if we need to, regulation or policy. Um, and the more the policies diverge or are created by different agencies or different regulatory structures, the, the harder that might be to coordinate. And so, for example, back to the car, if you have a car that's generally regulated by NHTSA and a car seat that can tell your heart monitor, um, that, that generally that type of data would yeah. be would be uh, regulated by uh, HHS. How do we ensure that there's no more risk and not increased risk because of different regulatory structures that maybe require different approaches to the data? Mm -hmm. I think it's an important question. Yeah, no, that's a good one. So when I think about risk around the Internet of Things, when I think about not only cars but medical equipment and industrial control systems like manufacturing process control. Um, Right now, I think we have a lot of vulnerability out there, and it's, it's not actually being actively exploited on the scale that I think many of us fear it could be. And that's temporarily sort of good luck that might last some narrow window of time. 
Uh, you know, we see month by month, though, increasing active exploitation of a lot of those vulnerabilities. We see cars being stolen in large volumes in certain cities based on security mistakes in the keyless entry, keyless ignition systems is just sort of one example. Um, so we see more and more exploitation happening in a lot of areas. Um, but my, my hope is that there will become there will come more transparency on how much security is built into these things. So that as we're looking to buy these things, you know, we can look at a box and know whether or not it was built against any sort of security standards, uh, whether it was built against any sort of security guidelines uh, in terms of, you know, does it have security for the communications for the device itself? Does it have the update capability? And is there anybody, you know, really making sure that that device stays safe and secure over time, that it has it built in up front and that it'll stay secure because the adversary is definitely on the move. So on that note, just to follow up, I think one of the positives is that IoT emerges 15 years after the great security awakening. I don't know, Jim, when would you say we started to understand as in the industry side and the developer side, oh, security isn't just the th things that those three guys with beards care about. Um, about 15 years into sort of doing secure software development. I would have said eight, but... Uh... <laughs> Good. Uh, so we have some expectations, and, and I, I think the openness is, is also key, the value that, you know, we now almost expect many of the large companies to do things like be able to receive vulnerability information and even have a bug bounty. Five years ago, that was revolutionary. Um, who's heard of Showdown? So if you haven't, don't do it now because it'll distract you from this fascinating panel in front of you. Uh, it is a search engine that allows you to find vulnerable interfaces for smart devices online. Uh, and in fact, you can sort of figure out, oh, these are all the things that are out there. There's a general awareness, at least inside the IT community, if not inside the broader consumer community, that security is something we need to take very seriously. Sorry, just to add to that, I think that's true in the technology industry. I think the challenge in an IoT environment is everybody is doing technology and everybody's doing security. So it's not just the large companies who are developing software, you know, sensors, chips, whatever um, systems, but it's also the mom and pop shops that are connecting their products to the internet who that have never been connected before and may not know how to write code or set up security. And then you also have the end user who then implements whatever that is, that thing is at home, who's also you know, configuring their own home network, et cetera. So the risks are not just at the thing. The risks are at all levels of it. And to be clear, I mean, we see both large companies and small companies get it right and get it wrong. I mean, we've had, in the last few weeks, we've had major router switch vendor have to, you know, issue a, a patch because they have no up, over the air update mechanism for updating all of their uh, switches when they had a vulnerability in the underlying operating system that they've depended on for, for decades. And so this vulnerability has been there for, for decades. And at the same time, you have smaller companies like Electric Imp, where a founder is out there raising awareness on the moral liability of you know, ship and forget, of sending these devices out there without these kinds of patches. So we've seen big companies get it right and get it wrong, and we've seen small companies get it right and get it wrong. The thing that really stuns me, though, is still the number of devices that are coming to market uh, either you know, completely without security or with maybe you know, one or two uh, security ingredients when they need like four or five or, or, or 10. And the number of misconceptions out there that security is just too hard to build into these systems or that these extremely constrained devices can't do security. When we have examples of devices that are the width of, width of a human hair, uh, you know, powered by bridge vibration, no battery, just harnessing energy from bridge vibration, they can do crypto with a pretty good key length, you know, good enough for US national security secret level information. And so when you can do crypto at 50 cents a chip, um, with that little energy and that small a form factor. I don't see how cost, size, or anything else are excuses for not building security into these devices anymore. Well, Brian, that's really interesting because I think if you talk to many people, you would hear that the simplicity of the device, the low cost of the device, are obstacles to making it secure, and you're saying it's not. It, it, it shouldn't be. Um, uh, admittedly, if you're trying to sell a device for less than 50 cents, it might be an obstacle. Um, but, I mean, uh, most of these IoT devices, you know, retail for, you know, north of $50, often north of $100. And when I hear automakers that are balking at, you know, paying a whole dollar for security for the car, I, you know, have a feeling they'll have to answer the mail in an uncomfortable situation at some point on those decisions. Can I just go back to something Brian said earlier about um, 
basically, I, I do think it's really important to get sort of some transparency and some competition around um, security, but it's something that has always been lacking, right? It's been difficult. Companies have sort of been able to say, at best, sort of like, we, we care and we take steps to secure your data, but it's hard for consumers to understand what they're actually yeah. doing and how well they're doing it, frankly. Um, so yeah, if we could move to that, that would be, that would be great. That, that's one of the reasons why over the last few years we've worked with so many organizations to try to get guidelines out there on what it means to build security into these devices. Not brand specific, uh, but really what does it mean? So we've worked with the Online Trust Alliance uh, to specify guidelines, and that's both for security and privacy, uh, as well as the Open Web Application Security Project, OWASP, has a top 10. Uh, we worked with the U.S. government, Department of Homeland Security, on the security tenants for live critical embedded systems. So whereas two years ago there might not have been guidelines for how to build security into these systems, those guidelines are out there now. It's really a question of which of the companies that are building smart connected products are actually adhering to good guidelines. I think from a consumer perspective and a small business perspective, though there's still work to be done, when you're thinking about securing your house, there are basic steps everybody knows, and you don't need tip sheets, and you do, they're, they're, it's second nature, right? You lock your door. Depending on where you live, you might put bars on your windows. We're still at you know two-page, 40-page, 60-page tip sheets that are complicated. People don't know how to read through and may not take the time. And so how do we get a culture to of, of security? I think one of the challenges, you can't expect the consumer to do nearly anything. It needs to be secure for them out of the box. There shouldn't be a tip sheet for them. It should just work. But in contrast to that, we have, you mentioned front doors. We have front door locks now that, again, within the last couple of weeks, we've had more demos of yet another brand where the door can actually be unlocked, physically unlocked, through the thing you thought you were buying to secure your home. Uh, you know, criminals can you know, use the security sure. vulnerabilities to actually enter your physical home. Alan, you wanted to jump in. Uh, so I think there are some parallels that we're not reinventing when it comes to cybersecurity in terms of levels of risk. So on one hand, uh, you have especially consumer-grade devices, front locks, <laughs> baby monitors in particular, uh, are just sort of astoundingly poorly secured, where what happens is someone has said, how can I sell more products? I know I will do the tech equivalent of sprinkle some bacon on something, right? It's the, just sprinkle a little network stack on it. Uh, you hire a relatively inexpensive developer, uh, and, and just setting up a network stack in your toaster, not that expensive. Uh, Finding a good security developer is pretty expensive. Or bringing in even the very sensible and reasonably priced services of some of the major American security companies, still a non-trivial expense for a consumer-grade device. Um, at the other extreme, we might look at something like uh, the auto manufacturers. So there was uh, a, uh, NHTSA had a summit, and uh, the Department of State was there. I said, well, why is the Department of State here? Well. They buy lots of cars, and in those cars, they put very important people. Uh, so they're very concerned about making sure that the cars aren't just resilient against uh, something that some very smart hobbyists can break, but that some very determined bad guys can break. And I think just as we often look at cybersecurity writ large as a hygiene level, you know, you must be this tall to get on the internet, uh, and then the how do you defend yourself against targeted adversaries, I think the same is, we should, there's no reason not to apply that same rubric to IoT. Let me, let me tweak that a little bit because I think one of the changes that we'll see uh, is that the, when you start putting more and more devices, routine household devices, uh, onto the internet, making them computerized and connected, that you know, sometimes people talk about the attack surface and IoT will increase the attack surface for cybersecurity. It will also increase the attack surface for lawyers. Right? And so one of the things that will be interesting to think about is what happens to liability uh, as you move into the Internet of Things. So far, you know, you get a, you get a piece of uh, equipment and you rip off the plastic and suddenly all liability is transferred to you. Um, is that going to hold? That's question one. What does liability look like when your toaster is a computing device? Question two is, do we need to do any intervention, or can we rely on the courts and cases and liability to drive better security? So number one, um, what does liability look like? So uh, this year we're about to have the 15th annual workshop on the economics of information security out in Berkeley. And economists have been saying, oh, we should have liability for computer security. It'll solve all the things, right? 
Uh, and that works well when you're an economist writing an equation on a whiteboard. Uh, I'm not a lawyer, but the second I mention that to any lawyers, they sort of sigh and get a weary look on their face and say, OK, let me explain to you the 60 years of case law around consumer liability and how complicated it is. Uh, and then you start talking to technologists, especially entrepreneurs, and you say, let's have liability. And then they say, well, OK. Um, so you're going to make some random person who makes any piece of software. This is still with software liability. Are they going to make them liable? Uh, what about open source? You know, either your liability bar is low. I got fished on my computer, and now I can sue the operating system manufacturer. Uh, or it's so high that it doesn't really help promote things. Um, however, IoT does allow us Thanks. to do a little bit of massaging. And I'll turn it over to some people who actually think a lot about consumer protection to sort of talk. Because I think that when it comes to exposing people to real risk that we have documented and uh, ability to sue and we have case law, it might be a way to sort of ease in without imposing a drastic burden that will sort of upend the entire digital ecosystem. Well, I guess I would just say that, so going back a ways, um, and let's talk about network security for a moment. So before you had the state breach notification laws, people would have breaches and they didn't even necessarily have to tell anybody about it. So then ultimately the states started passing the breach notification laws and you at least had to tell somebody about it. But you still don't necessarily know like if there's a bad guy out there who's doing identity theft, it's not clear unless you catch the person where he got the data. So there's a sort of disconnect in the system. Um, and as you say, if you have a computer and something bad happens, we all have software from you know, there's the operating system, there's your browser, there's other stuff on your computer. You don't really know which, which one of them was sort of responsible or which one of them maybe, um, you know, and sometimes it's sort of like interlocking vulnerabilities in, in other ones. So liability um, could be a solution if you could sort of figure out more directly where the connection is between the, the harm and the, the exploitation. Um, but that's not something that's happened yet. Mm -hmm. So I think the liability word obviously gives people pause, uh, but I see two things really resonating with, uh, resonating with executives, even at the board level, that's driving investment in IoT security, and I think in a very healthy way. And one of them is brand protection. And so this starts with examples like the 1.4 million uh, vehicle recall. Um, and this starts with things like CEOs stepping down when uh, point of sale systems are, are breached at, at scale. Um, really uh, pro protecting the brand against the scale of what could happen, I think, is driving some companies to invest appropriately in beginning to put the security into these devices that really needs to be there. The other is realizing that security done right can be a huge enabler. So, um, you know, the, one of the most popular electric cars right now launched uh, not only an autopilot feature, but a valet and summon uh, feature. And they did this through, uh, you know, over-the-air updates uh, to the software, which they had to build in a lot of security to be able to safely update the vehicle end-to-end, -end, including the brakes and the shocks and everything else, update all of the software in the vehicle. They had a lot of, have a lot of security to do that. But once they had the security, they realized they could dynamically deploy new functionality to their customers which would not only make their brand even more compelling moving forward in terms of how quickly they can innovate, but it also gives them ways to monetize their customers long after that initial sale. And all of a sudden, you know, executors are realizing, wow, if I build in security into these things, that will enable me to monetize my customers in new ways and innovate faster than my competitors, deliver functionality into the market faster than my competitors. All of a sudden, security is an enabler. And between brand protection and security as an enablement, I really see those two things sort of driving in some companies healthy investment towards security. And I think getting sort of to close on that point, I think on liability, there's an assumption again that we're talking about large companies, we can pinpoint the problem and there's maybe redress on the other end. And I think in, in what we're seeing is there's a lot of activity and innovation that's not in among those big companies, it's happening in a lot of places, smaller companies, mom and pop shops. I think that's one problem. Also, it assumes problems will occur, and they will. 
but again, from a, from a, a congressional perspective, we want to make sure that we're enabling the innovation. We're also protecting consumers before the problems happen, if we can. And also, I think it's important to avoid uh, reacting legislatively to problems, because that's when you get maybe faster legislation, maybe things that are not as thought through. And so really looking. No, that would never happen. <laughs> really looking at these things in a proactive yeah. way yeah. Uh, instead of reactive. Well, Brian said something that I don't know. If, I don't know if people reacted to, but you said uh, monetize their uh, customers, and so we wrestled with that. We did a report. We've done a couple reports around the Internet of Things. We wrestled with this and didn't really come out to a good conclusion, which is the business model of the Internet, and a very successful model, and one that we want to be careful in tinkering with, is monetizing your data to drive innovation, to drive the delivery of services. People who have monkeyed with it, say like the European Commission, have had uh, unhappy consequences when it comes to their internet industry. But it raises a whole set of problems for IoT, because you're going to have a huge amount of data on a whole range of things. And so I think we want to talk a little bit about that. Who owns the data? What data do we care about? How do we protect it in a way that, to Malika's point, that doesn't kill innovation? So I don't know who wants to go first. I'll, the, the data ownership one, I, frankly, I don't care if somebody knows the, the tire pressure of my car. I mean, I don't. But there might be other data, and everyone always says medical devices, that I do care about. So how do we start making that, dis, that set of distinctions in how do we approach this problem? Also, I think even before we even get to who owns the data is questioning um, some of the ways we've thought about privacy um, in particular before. Um, I love to use the example of um, uh, that Tom Cruise movie, uh, Minority Report, oh. not people seeing into the future, but this concept of walking outside and biometrics recognizing who you are so you can get targeted advertising, et cetera, right? They're, you're always interacting with devices, with things. Mm -hmm. And so a simple concept like um, opt-in, what does that look like in that environment? And as we think about policies, what does that look like 10 years from now with that technology deployment? So it's not just who owns the data, but even just whether choices are choices real in that environment, and if not, how do we manage for that? There are questions we don't have answers to. Do do we have? I, mean, I know you want to talk about it, but, but do we have answers to that for that with the technology we have now? Possibly not. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, go ahead. Well, can I just um, so one thing that this makes me think of is um, privacy by design, right? So. Mm. There was some research um, by some researchers in Germany, and they, um, they did it in the context of the smart meter. And the smart meter reported basically a constant stream of data about um, a household's utility use. And they were able to determine by looking at the electricity use, they could tell what the, the household was watching on TV. Um, they also were able to, to realize that you know, this information was going unencrypted and so they could actually manipulate the, um, the household's electricity bill either up or down. So that would be a concern from the utilities point of view of being paid, but from a privacy point of view, um, you know, it's just interesting that they were able to determine what TV you're watching. So there's a fairly easy solution, which is that if you report the energy use every 15 minutes, um, you can't necessarily do that fine analysis of what somebody's watching. Mm -hmm. So, and, and a lot of um, smart meters do report every 15 minutes. So that's something where if you think about the problem in advance, you can sort of head off certain problems. Um, from a privacy perspective, one thing that we've been concerned about primarily is the unexpected use. So it's where, you know, you knew you have a device that's for some certain purpose, you know it's being collected and used for that purpose, that's you know, fine, but then a few years later, um, some sort of like entirely different use is being made of it. And we've brought some cases, for example, the Google Buzz case, um, it, it involved um, basically a, an email service, Gmail, that was then sort of converted later into a social network. And so they ended up using um, you know, the list of people that you emailed frequently as the basis for the social network. And so some people found that, that their social media network was pre-populated with like their ex-husband or 
um, or their psychiatrist or whatever. Um, so that's the kind of privacy thing that you don't want to see happen, the unexpected use. But the, the minority report taken you know, to the IoT these days, the uh, uh, interesting uh, example, that if, if free vacuum cleaner, uh, don't worry, it will DNA sequence you know, all of the inhabitants, you know, all of your guests, as well as you know, whether or not you have kids, uh, elderly, uh, pets, uh, and then you know, mark it to you. But the vacuum is free. Um, <laughs> And you know, I, I don't know if that's the world that people want, but between what people agree to willingly, what they don't realize they uh, agree to that's in the fine print, what companies do behind the scenes, it's sort of in violation of the agreements that they've signed, uh, as well as not having the security controls on the information despite what they're actually trying to do. All of those, those, those privacy concerns uh, t together um, are, are, are worrisome. But I, I do go back to the, uh, the engine temperature. If my uh, social security number was stolen for a 59th time, it wouldn't kill me. Uh, but with medical devices, our vehicles, and countless other cyber physical systems, there are, are real risks there. And I look at sort of national scale dependence on things like electrical grids, water systems, water treatment plants, and the like. And uh, I worry about privacy, but I worry more about national scale. So there's a very interesting counterexample to the smart meter uh, issue, and uh, forgive me, his name is just to my head. There's a researcher, a professor at the University of Michigan, who with some of the students uh, developed some technology to monitor the power usage of a medical device. So uh, a drug drip tool, and it pr turns out it's incredibly predictable how much power this is going to draw. But it's also smart, it has a fully implemented uh, network stack. So you can actually monitor the power that this device is drawing to detect whether or not there is malware on this device. And they've been able to show that, yes, one, there is live malware that's circulating because people use sort of Windows operating systems on these drug devices. But they're actually able to show, yeah, we can tell just by you, you take your device and you plug it into their magic box and you plug the magic box into the wall and it will be able to say, yes, there is malware working on this. So there is data that is useful. The challenge is we won't be able to use any of that data if we don't protect it and build trust. Uh, and there are many different ways that we can use, that we can help to foster trust. One of them is through sort of voluntary industry-led consortia, like the OTA, uh, like NTIA's efforts uh, at multi-stakeholder processes. Uh, and when those don't work, then maybe it is the government can help and say, listen, in order to promote this business, we need to lay some ground rules uh, to build trust, because otherwise we simply won't have any of this nice stuff in, I mean, in, in my dreams, malware detection is as reliable as you know, uh, listening to the power analysis. As, uh, and I realize there are companies out there doing that, but I'm not Just sure FOIA transforms. It's, uh, <laughs> yeah. Let me give you a counterexample that's an anecdote. So it could be true, it could be wrong, but I heard it from one of the big uh, uh, aircraft companies where they said that they now have components on the aircraft that reports while your plane is in flight on engine status, control status, you know, fuel and all this, and it reports back to the, the uh, aircraft base, right? And um, in some of the reporting, it will, so the aircraft is basically sending an email to uh, its maintenance engineer, and in some cases it will include the name of the engineer. And this uh, aircraft manufacturer alleged to me that under uh, European Union rules, that made it uh, personally identifiable information, and the uh, aircraft uh, component had to, you know, notify, get consent, uh, say it was using cookies, all that other stuff. How do we draw the line here so it doesn't become, whether that story is true or not, I don't care because it's such a good story, but um, how do we draw the line in thinking about the data that your, your IoT devices will be generating? Where do we say, yeah, this is what I care about, this deserves special consideration, and where do we say, you know what, I don't care? So I think that gets to a point to, and you mentioned in your paper, thinking about this in, in sort of vertical sector, or sector-specific mm -hmm. types of data, right? Are there types of data that are, maybe they're sector-specific um, on critical security, critical infrastructure, or health, that deserve better protection or more requirements, cybersecurity or privacy or others than, 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 than other types of data? I think a challenge, and again, going through the work that we've done um, just on the Digit Act and, and, and the outreach we've done with different groups, there's a concern, again, of 
different regulatory requirements across different technologies. And a lot of the technologies companies are building go across sectors. They're used in aviation, healthcare, um, education, critical infrastructure. And so um, what is that balance? You, how, do you, how do you protect the right types of data and not overprotect others from a privacy or security perspective, but at the same time have a, some, several, some level of a, a level playing field so mm. that they're not completely different requirements that are impossible to implement, especially on the back end. If, if a, if a back end system, a cloud system or other, has to comply with different security requirements for transportation data, healthcare data, child data, whatever, how do you accommodate for that in an implementation? And so from a regular, regulatory perspective, I think that's, that's a big challenge. Yeah, you know, working in the Industrial Internet Consortia, we have you know pages of relevant standards and guidelines that, that can be uh, followed. Eventually, we had to create just sort of an appendix of, of all of the sort of relevant guidelines and standards that should be followed. And that's why I keep coming back to transparency, because if when I bought a product, I just knew which standards or guidelines were followed uh, in building this, if a, if a company would just sort of step up to saying that we at least followed these, then there could be sort of you know, consequences for them if they're misrepresenting that, if they're falsely advertising that. But at the moment, you know, I, I try to uh, buy uh, industrial robotics or um, uh, consumer good off the shelf, and I, I really don't know what kind of security has been built into it. Do we all agree that uh, one size doesn't fit all and that you need to think about risk, whether it's to privacy or something else on sort of a sectoral basis or device basis? And is that sort of one of the conclusions we can draw here? So, so there are real risks in some horizontal questions of looking at a vertical. Mm -hmm. So for example, if you're trying to talk about vulnerability disclosure, <coughs> uh, are you going to ask uh, a fairly skilled DEF CON style hacker? You need to know the difference between FDA regulations and DOT regulations and make sure that you're compliant with this bank. Uh, I, I think what we want to do is find a way to make it as easy as possible for the security researcher to work with the vendor. Uh, so there, while on one hand no one would say, yes, it all needs to be one size fits all, there are going to be certain horizontal access points where you're going to say, listen, we need to make it as simple as possible to provide policy and technology overlays across the whole digital ecosystem. We never answered the question of who owns the data. You would like us to solve all of global privacy transfers in the next few minutes up here? I'm game if you guys are, but. Uh, yeah, I would. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I think when uh, the buyer uh, buys something, they uh, agree uh, to certain ownership terms. That varies you know, by, by contract, but very often they're signing away uh, more of their ownership of their information than, than they realize. And it's not just theirs. You mentioned the Online Trust Alliance, which has been working with um, uh, a, a realty, uh, a real estate agent trade group. Uh, and one of the things they've done is sort of helping real estate agents build the catalog of go through the home and, that you're selling and identify what are the smart goods. Because if something's embedded in a home or a car, I'm not actually the person who did the original EULA, who did that original risk calculation. Uh, and the more things are embedded in the world around us, uh, you know, in, in the privacy world, it's cliche to say that notice and choice is insufficient at best. Um, my colleagues at the FTC may uh, have, have even delved more deeply into that question. Um, but there has to be, I, I return to this notion that uh, something that policymakers, whether think tanks or in the government can do is say, listen, uh, if we can't get this right, it's going to break, and just relying on the short-term benefits isn't going to win. So, so I, I do like your question, though, before that, on uh, how much things vary by vertical, uh, one size fits all. Because if I look at medical, for example, where uh, there is a fair amount of regulatory infrastructure in place right now, uh, where people who build medical devices are forced to disclose through medical device documentation uh, statements, you know, what sort of security standards, what sort of security technology has been built into or not built into the device. But the reality is, in a lot of cases, they're simply disclosing that they haven't built in as much security as potentially could be. So there's still not yet, in most cases, an adequate forcing function to drive enough security to be built into these devices, even where lives are sort of clearly at stake. 
let alone in the sort of the consumer and the manufacturing and the other you know, critical infrastructure. In but I, I want to, sorry, oh, may I just jump in on the medical? Because I think on one hand, you're, you're right that there is a lot of uncertainty. On the other hand, uh, I think we should acknowledge that the FDA did something that was very proactive for what is traditionally a quite strict command and control regulator. The FDA, not known for being sort of loosey-goosey, come-as-you-are type regulator. They have very strict rules, but they said, you know what? Uh, we're going to draw a distinction in medical devices between a malfunction by medical service, right? You say you're going to deliver this amount of radiation and you get it wrong. You implemented the wrong algorithm. If you do that, what's called an aftermarket defect, we're going to use all of our regulatory powers to really punish you, right? This is deterrence, making sure that everyone gets right the first time. Uh, and, and also, um, right, and, and people will notice that they're medical errors. But they separate, they said if it's security, for example, if it's the authentication mechanism that we use to make sure that it's a, uh, someone who has the proper permissions to enter, if that part's broken and you realize it and you fix it under certain fairly prescribed fashions, then that's okay. Your punishment is much less severe, just take care of it. You have to tell us, but we're not going to go through the entire serious regulatory punitive measure. And I think that's incredibly forward-looking action of using their regulatory power to say, listen, we understand this is an evolving space. We understand that in some ways it's already out of the bag. Right? We can't go through and say every hospital, take out every network staff, remove every smart device. So how do we get as much good security in place? How do we raise the level of hygiene as fast as possible? And that's by working with the vendor community to make them want to, to, to not make them want to hide from new security information. I would applaud the FDA for that. The other thing that they did very related is mm -hmm. that if it's a security mistake, the, the company building the device doesn't have to repeat the entire recertification process. Whereas if you ship new functionality, you have to certify the new device. You have to certify the new software for the device. But if it's just a security fix, to simply lower risk without changing functionality, you do not have to repeat the whole lengthy certification process. So that was also an, yet another thing for me, for I think all of us to really applaud FDA on. So I'm, I'm very glad with some of the decisions they've made. Mark, you were gonna... Well, I was something. just gonna say that um, we put out, you were talking earlier about coordination between different sectors and so forth. So we put out this piece intended for mobile app developers to sort of make sure that they understand, hey, if your app does this kind of thing, then FDA owns you, sort of, and you have to get pre-approval and whatever. And if you, if you are serving this kind of person, then you are under HHS. And if not, if this applies, you're under us. Mm -hmm. So um, we put that out, as well as some business education piece. But sort of going back to your question, I mean, I think that most of the security standards, I feel like, um, just sort of, as well as our enforcement approach have this sort of built-in kind of like everything depends on the sensitivity of the information. Mm -hmm. So to your question, um, a lot of times if you have a particular type of information that's more sensitive, then your protections have to be greater for that. But essentially your framework is the same. You're still asking the same question and maybe you're doing more for, you know, an SSN than you're doing for, you know, is your wine bottle cold or is your wine bottle hot? Whatever. I think as long as all the agencies right, agree, FDA and NHTSA, for example, transportation, that, that's, where, that's where we'll see if it's successful, and that's, right? If so, I mean, a similar approach. I, I, in, there's part of me that, that really appeals, sort of the common sense of it really depends on the type of information. But after 20 years of building security into aircraft, spacecraft, vehicles, aviation ground stations, cellular base stations, consumer electronics, critical infrastructure. Some of the things that I've, I've started to realize is that information is often sort of important and sensitive and critical to the system in ways that we forget about or, or fail to realize. So information is often more important than we realize, like the engine temperature that I mentioned earlier. If you spoof, forge, or fake that along with vehicle speed, gear selection, you can actually cause you know, certain vehicles to go into a shutdown mode that's just not good at highway speeds. So information that you think isn't necessarily sensitive might be more sensitive than, than you realize. And the other thing is, as an engineer, it doesn't make sense to build in 
multiple security mechanisms to do the same thing sort of to different degrees in a lot of cases. If you just, if you only have the resources to build one security mechanism and build it in right once and use it everywhere. So one of the examples that we get into is in sending information. How much of the information needs to be authenticated so that you can verify the information? Well, if you can't verify the information, in other words, it could be spoofed or forged or faked, why waste the battery or the bandwidth sending it if you can't authenticate it? So a lot of these systems are extremely constrained devices. There's not much left to the system that isn't important, so just lock the whole thing down. Well, if I can follow up on that, um, there was a, an incident a few years ago where somebody had a, an Internet of Things light bulb, mm -hmm. and they did not authenticate, and so it was sort of passing along Wi-Fi passwords, which, again, it's a light bulb, so you don't really care about knowing whether the light bulb's on or off, but it was exposing these Wi-Fi passwords. Um, <laughs> exposing well. usernames as well. Um, uh, you know, we've seen a lot of mistakes. We've also seen the videos where uh, you know, somebody is uh, you know, uh, trying to sleep, and the lights come on. And they get up, and before they get over to the wall switch <laughs> to turn it off, the lights go off. They try to go back to bed. The lights come on. I mean, it's humorous in a conference-like setting, but it'd be pretty annoying if you're actually <laughs> living through, through this kind of harassment. Um, and, and this goes to say that you know, building security into these things isn't impossible. In a lot of cases, it's dimes, not dollars, to get security built into these things. And so they, they really need security built in. But I think we do suffer from sort of a lack of awareness on how to build security into these things and how to build it in cost effectively. That's why I've spent so much of my life over the last year you know, on the road trying to raise awareness, trying to help organizations learn how to build security in, whether they build in our stuff or the competitors, to at least build security in and build it in right. Although um, we, we will need to think about the severity of the incident, and there's a line between severe and prank that we probably need to talk a little bit more about. But someone, I think it, it, it might have been uh, Brian, talked about a forcing function. So one of the things we want to think about is how do you force, how do you incentivize better security in IoT devices? And maybe a good way to start that, they may not be able to answer this, but I'll give it a try. What would you want Congress to do? <laughs> I'll let them answer first. Okay. <laughs> we have some ideas, but... I'm sorry, Mr. the question. What would we want? Congress. 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 Yeah. Congress, yeah. Continue to provide excellent oversight of the Department of Commerce. Uh -huh. <laughs> That's a good answer. Well, I would say that in the Internet of Things report, um, we didn't call for specific um, mm. IoT-related legislation, but we, um, I mean, or the commission, has called for general privacy legislation and, and data security legislation mm -hmm. in the past, including breach notification. And one thing that we pointed out was again that you know the state breach notification laws are tied to personal information. So again, if somebody um, if there's a vulnerability in your internet door lock and that gets out there, there's no obligation to let customers know about mm -hmm. that. So um, we suggested you know, adding device functionality basically to, to the types of things. How would that work? So device functionality, the manufacturer would have to notify whoever purchased the thing that there was a, a flaw or what would it? Sure, if there was a, you know, a vulnerability that's being exploited, for example, that, you know, this lock is just not secure, you know, mm -hmm. they'd either provide notice on their website or to registered users or what have you um, about the vulnerability, sure. Okay. So I think transparency would go a long way. I'm hoping to see more energy for sort of a market-driven solution, solution that sort of forces transparency or makes the transparency easy, like a stamp on the device. Um, but you know, at the same time, I would concede that there's probably some areas that are Im important to uh, us, important enough to us at a sort of a societal level, um, that we might come to a point that for those areas, the government might need to take a much more active role uh, in ensuring that mm -hmm. security is, is built into these things. I think what's interesting from, for just baseline privacy legislation or, or secure data security legislation that the FTC supported in the past, I think it's not a new debate. Um, I just think IoT, the, the, it's exponential in, in, in potential, right? The data is exponential. And so I think the same context applies to those discussions and those points of view. The, the work that the senators have tried to do is really, again, as this um, next iteration of the internet takes off, how do we enable it and how do we ensure that um, we have no um, 
fast reactions, right? So there's a level of awareness and mm -hmm. education. We have data. We understand how the industry is evolving. And that's been a big priority so far, at least for, I think, both the House and the Senate. The other thing that we've, we've started looking at is um, sort of recognizing that there are a lot of companies, small companies involved in IoT. How do you facilitate the, the resources we have today and make those accessible to small companies? And so, for example, the NIST framework, 40-page document, um, is a very, very thoughtful um, document, uh, has had a lot of industry participation and support. How do you um, make that available and accessible to small companies? And that's something that we're looking at as well. How much of this is an internet problem as opposed to an internet of things problem? Well, I remember the early um, uh, you know, request for the RFCs or request mm -hmm. for comments of the uh, internet protocol specification that explicitly stated on the otherwise blank page, security is not a design consideration for these internet protocols. Um, uh, but then mm -hmm. I, I look at these things and it, it uh, you know, I see physical things in, in our world and in our lives uh, that it, it scares me uh, where, you know, security was not a design consideration for these physical things. So, uh, you know, I, I think it's a lot of this, in some cases, a lot of the same thinking, uh, but suddenly it's in uh, physical things where the stakes are in some, some cases higher. Uh, and, and a lot of the things, you know, it's not the case that automotive has not been thinking about security. Mm -hmm. I mean, the vehicle that was hacked last year had a security gateway in it. It's just that security wasn't done right. Uh, you know, it didn't adhere to those kinds of uh, principles that we were uh, describing earlier. But one of the decisions uh, made in the uh, commercialization of the internet, which was a policy decision at the White House, was that uh, we knew it was uh, not secure and we decided that it was worth it economically to go ahead. And I still think that was the right decision because you got trillions in benefit and you know billions in losses, of course. But in terms of the trade, are we facing the same kind of trade for the? I, I look at uh, what we expect out of the internet. We expect it to be a wonderfully open kind of environment, and it is. But you can layer on top of that all kinds of very secure transactions. Mm. If you have the right cryptography, and good key management around that, as well as you know, good security on both the endpoints, both the, the client and server for the client server of stuff. Um, so you can build good security on top of a lot of the vulnerabilities that are in the internet. But what we see happening are devices that are sort of built without that security built in. And where we talk about liability, you know, for a, a home PC where you've got you know, 13 different applications, any of which might be malicious on top of an operating system built by one vendor with libraries that are in some case open source and hardware by a, you know, yet another party, how you solve liability in that world, I don't know. But when I buy a box off the shelf where the hardware and software come from the same company, if that toaster lights fire to my house, people know who they're going to sue. I mean, you have a hardware software, you have a lot more of accountability on the brand for the, uh, these Internet of Things mm -hmm. things. Um, but at the same time, we don't necessarily see that level of attention on security yet. So, uh, by the way, I think that's a, a really great point, that we can overlay and bolt on security not well, right? No one really loves bolt on security, but you can overlay at different layers in the broader digital, in the broader internet. But once you start talking about devices, things, it gets a little harder to do that unless you have sort of a centralized architecture. If it's you know something that is, uh, you know, on a shop floor or an industrial control system, which is built to provide that security uh, and is aware of all the risks, it's built around that model. Um, but you know, I think we've been the question of what's actually new here, apart from just the endpoints that go boom rather than just fizzle, uh, is, is important. You know, we've been trying, the software, the software Engineering Institute first tried to say, formally, how do we write secure software back in the late 90s? Uh, you know, we've been wrestling with this for a long time. Uh, I think it's, what's new here is just the, the shape of our risk exposure um, you know, what happens if a big three car manufacturer suddenly so just becomes apparent that, oh, we're not going to say exactly the details because, you know, that was sort of panic. But by the way, there's a vulnerability and there's an exploit in the wild. Right? What happens to consumer confidence? What are the real costs? Of, would, how long would it take for that manufacturer to get anyone to buy? Like, we sort of realized, oh, software manufacturers are going to have vulnerabilities we're still going to use Flash. We're still going to use Windows. So, if so, it's your car, 
Like, that's massive economic cost. Doesn't it depend on the consequences, though? If Completely. It's a, oh, very much so. If it's but, a flaw and nothing happens, but, but, this I mean, is a rather zen-like question. From a market confidence perspective, mm -hmm. uh, it may. If we're talking about flaws that can remotely run a vehicle off the road, I mean, that's a, that's a, a pretty you know, impactful bar. But the, the level of response that we've seen out of different organizations, we've had some boards of automakers approach us you know, at that level and want to make sure that their brand is getting security right. And we've had others tell us point blank that they're not willing to pay more than uh, you know, a, a, a dollar uh, for uh, security. And, and to me, that's just stunning. Just that, that difference in, in level of attention on security is, is just stunning. And if the difference in level of security built into vehicles is, in fact, that dramatic, consumers need to know. They need to know which brands are investing in the security that will keep them safe from hackers and others who want to remotely run their car off the road. And they need to know which brands haven't made those investments. I think also, at the end of the day, the opportunity for IoT is tremendous. We've talked a lot about the transportation industry, but think about healthcare and enabling people to stay home longer, right? Stay in their homes as they grow older longer. So I think we have to get this right and not wait for those big mass. I wonder problems. though, and so one of the things, those of you who've followed this field for a while, remember uh, the famous uh, uh, cyber Pearl Harbor, right? And you can, you can make up your own, uh, your own analogy. And so we had these predictions of uh, calamitous events and now it's been uh, uh, about 21 years and they never happened. So when I hear about the potential for calamitous events, my thinking about it is colored by the fact that I've seen this movie before and it turned out to be wrong. So why is it different this time? A hacker can take over a car and force it off the road. Maybe they have to want to. How many can they do at the same time? It's, it's like, uh, you know, Shodan is a lot of fun if you want to go and check out you know, I'm, uh, I'm, what's vulnerable. So we're, we have sort of a very different attitudes towards risk here. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, but uh, there, there are some things in my life that I won't forget. Um, but, you know, being on the Defense Science Board, you know, before 9-11, looking at intelligence needs for Homeland Defense, and, uh, you know, people talking about, uh, you know, uh, Kansas City, uh, you know, attempts to bring down, you know, World Trade Center buildings and uh, airplanes have been hijacked, and, uh, and yet the world is a very different place post 9-11. I think it's foolish to believe that just because we haven't seen large-scale exploitation of these kinds of things, that, that we won't at some point, if we don't change course at some point. A lot of the saving grace has been resilience, accidental resilience in many cases. Uh, so if your risk is localized, right, this system fails because you can attack it, but it's different enough or it's hard enough to attack everything at the same time uh, that forces the attacker to sort of figure out and prioritize not to break everything. Uh, as we move more into especially the cyber physical system, which uh, we often differentiate from IoT because there's a feedback loop of cyber physical systems use the smart controller to then change things and get data from. So you're creating a feedback loop between the reality and, and your digital system. Um, as that gets more concentrated and more broadly deployed, we're going to get more into a uniculture uh, or using or reliance on common shared platforms. Uh, and that means that if there is something, even if the risk is smaller, uh, the ramification gets bigger. And you're right, we have been talking about that phenomena for a while. Um, but this is, is one of those areas where a lot of what's been saving us in the past has been uh, a certain amount of built-in uh, man, uh, manual interventions, and we're slowly automating our way out of those. So, I mean, a lot of people saw the car get hacked and remotely run off the road last year and then said, but wait. You know, one of those guys was ex-agency from one of the top agencies in the business, and it still took them a few years. Less than a year later, I was in China on business, and I'm sitting at an automotive conference, and there was a team in China. That with, I think the team was a team of roughly two people, and in six months replicated pretty much, you know, everything, the same types of attacks against a completely different model of car, I believe not using any of the materials that um, uh, those two hackers released. A team of two people, six months, completely different model of car. So it's, it's um, and you know, even in the, the, the folks that did the talk that caught the headlines last year, um, most of 
you know, their time, they were very candid, was spent on sort of you know, dead ends and wrong turns that you know, if they had it to do all over again, it's, it's a, when two people six months can take out an entire brand of vehicles, you know, about three years, a whole generation of vehicles from a given brand, and it's not specific to one brand. It's not applicable to all of the brands, but it's not just applicable to one. I mean, it's these, a lot of these security mistakes are made across many, 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 many different brands, but the brands aren't the same, but there isn't enough transparency in the system right now uh, for buyers to make informed decisions, and that's the dangerous part. I think, I think that the, the thing, too, is the risk is real. We can debate how big, um, but waiting for that big thing to happen, to have these conversations, is risky. Yeah, there's an assumption that the big thing will happen, though, and that's, I guess, the part that I'm challenging, mm -hmm. is that it... It, it sounds easy and, you know, we have seen some incidents of the German steel mill hack or the Ukrainian uh, uh, electrical utility hack. Those were stocks net. You can, you can find a handful of incidents where there's been real effect, but they've been politically motivated, they've been really focused, and they haven't had this kind of mass effect that you guys are worried so, about. So, so Jim, I, I think I probably am on the cyber skeptic side of the spectrum, at least mm -hmm. compared to many people in, in, in this town, especially some of the new, very zealous converts <laughs> uh, to cyber, cyber, cyber. But one, just on the nature of risk, the fact that something doesn't happen doesn't mean that the risk isn't out there. Uh, and then two, you can sort of see some of the building blocks of how hard it is going to be to take any action if we change our mind and say, oh, this would be nice to have later. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, you think about the installed code base of something like Windows 95. Uh, you know, that's going to be in the global south for 20 years, uh, maybe 15 years. Um, the stuff that we're developing now, that we're selling now, is going to be with us. And so if nothing else, uh, we want to be, the danger of sounding the alarm is not that we're wasting money thinking about how to build secure systems. <laughs> I think that's well spent. The danger of being overly alarmist is that we run around and say, we must do something, and then whatever someone with a vested interest says, why, well, I have something right here, and it's yours for a low, low price that we glom on immediately. Whether it is uh, regulation that can limit things or whether it's business solutions that don't work. And I want to highlight the other risk, which you led with, actually, which is that IoT has the potential to save lives. Between reducing collisions, between uh, reducing uh, mistakes in hospitals, um, it, it has the power to uh, enrich our lives and, and save lives in countless ways. And so it's a, it's a technology that I believe should be embraced uh, and carefully. Well, I want to come back to risk, because in Washington, I think sometimes there's a tendency to look at the risk problem through the wrong end of the telescope. But while we still have time, I also want to talk about identity. And so I almost had a chapter in the thing called, on the internet, no one knows you're a refrigerator, right? Because we're going to have devices that will have identities or maybe act for you. Uh, and so one of the things we want to talk about is, how do we think about identity? What does that mean for consent, for authentication? What are the problems that are different here than the problems we face on the, on the good old regular internet. So, I mean, one, on the internet, people do know <coughs> that you're a fridge. Uh, for those of you who are in the security world, you may have heard of our, our old friend Weave, uh, who's uh, at it again, uh, <laughs> and basically found that uh, despite the fact that University of California, Berkeley, has an excellent CIO and CISO, uh, somehow there were still some network printers that had their own IP address. Uh, and you should never give devices their own IP address, and so this uh, security-focused troll decided to print some truly horrible things, uh, just spewing out of printers all over Berkeley. Uh, so I think, one, th there's, that gets to the basics of, of you know, there are certain hygiene things you can do to block the identity. Uh, once we start looking forward and saying, oh, I'm going to have a cloud of smart things around me, and I'm going, because there isn't that much of a user interface on this or on my smart shoe or something like that, we're going to have, we're going to rely on a, a hierarchy of, of controlling devices. So, you know, my phone will provide real-time feedback about my smart clothing 
and I'll use a cloud-based platform to set the preferences and, and configure how it shares. Um, once those start to play with other things, uh, then it gets a little tricky. Uh, I still think we're pretty far from that level of sophistication just because it's a, it's a chicken and egg problem that it works much, it is far easier to develop that inside a single platform. You know, Google just owns all of it. Uh, if, if we're depending on different vendors to work together and have APIs uh, that just work naturally, I, I don't see that happening that soon. If people have questions, they should hold up their hand, but while you're thinking about it, oh, we got one there. Let me, let me do one more, which is... Can I just follow yeah. up on that? Because um, Identity, your, yeah. your question reminded me of the, um, the issue of the guy who wrote some kind of Twitter bot that, oh, yeah. that sent out a death threat against somebody. Um, I believe he was in Holland or something, and he had somehow div devised this thing to auto-tweet. And, um, and there were some issues where he was sort of momentarily being investigated on, uh, because of this message by his bot. But I thought it was an interesting riff on your issue of attribution and, and who's responsible. Um, do, we, do we need to rethink our concept of identity, or at least online identity, now that you're going to have machines acting as agents, as individuals? with IP addresses in many cases. So, so I think all of the notions of sort of delegation and control and who has responsibility for a device are interesting. In some ways, identity for a device is easier than an identity for a person. I mean, we've issued you know, identity credentials for over a billion of these uh, I IoT uh, things. To say. And, and they're, you know, somebody can put them on a physical street corner or a digital street corner, um, or, or they can put them in a, in a, a, you know, a private office space. That's, that's really uh, their decision on, on the thing. But I'm really eager to get the questions from the audience, because I saw like four, four, Oh, wow, minutes. we had a bunch. I'm oh, sorry. Uh, yeah. We had uh, your first, your second, your third. Go ahead, please. Oh, we're having a microphone. How exciting. Hi, my name is Elias Okwara. I'm with the Global Governance Institute. Thanks very much uh, for the great discussion. And I wanted to get a sense from the panel. You've underscored the importance of security in IoT. i um, wondering what you think about the debate that's playing out in Congress right now about the ability of law enforcement to gain access to mobile devices or data, uh, and specifically uh, encryption. Of course, uh, Brian, you talked about sort of the security by design. Mark, you talked about privacy by design. Uh, Alan, you have that background in cybersecurity, so I'm wondering how is the issue, should, how should the issue be looked at? And certainly, Malika, you, know, you mentioned the importance of not reacting uh, to issues, but you do see in the Senate that there is a draft bill responding to the San Bernardino issue, so I'm wondering uh, to what extent is the IoT working group weighing in on that debate at the Senate level? So the IoT working group's not uh, weighing in on the encryption debate, specifically in the context of national security or civil liberties. Um, but I think that's a great example of you know taking the time to uh, study an issue um, as members of Congress can and have in the case of IoT is, is re very relevant. Um, uh, Senator Schatz, my boss, has supported uh, Senator Warner's proposal for a commission. Again, some of these issues are very complex, will not get resolved and should not get resolved at a time of crisis or well, because they're driven by an event. And so whether the commission is the right approach or not, I think um, on this issue in particular, uh, taking the time to think about it um, very deeply with a lot of experts around the table with different perspectives is, is critical. So we don't uh, condone or encourage uh, insertion of backdoors into any form of security mechanism. Um, we were hoping uh, that uh, law enforcement would find a different solution uh, than what they were advocating. And personally, I was relieved that they, they seemed to have found uh, a different solution. We had a... I, I'm sorry, my policy guy is sitting right there and he just coughed. Oh. So. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Thank you. He's actually coughing. Okay. That's an actual cough and not a warning. Oh, good. Um, we had a, uh, actually this morning we had a session that was a closed session with uh, a number of law enforcement officials from uh, about 20 countries to talk about this. And I think the, the easy way to describe it would be that there is a global concern over the ability to get access to data that nobody wants back doors. So that one's off the table. It's not even really an off issue of discussion. 
And that one of the things that people are interested in is will the fact that you're now going to have multiple devices uh, connected to the internet uh, be a way to compensate for the lack of surveillance capabilities that end-to-end -end encryption should be. And so we've talked about some of it tangentially up here, which is that um, I may not be able to monitor your communications, but I can use your power flows in a way that will tell me something about what you're doing. So I think this is at a very early stage. Most of the people we've talked to have not thought. Most of the people in the law enforcement community have not thought about how to exploit uh, the advantages that IoT may bring, uh, but it could be a balancing factor in this. I don't know if I... Okay, no? It's loads of fun. Next, please. Uh, Kelly Emmerich with the Secure ID Coalition. Thank you all for a very interesting discussion. Jim, nice to see you. Um, I wanted to ask the question, you started to talk about identity and you got to identity of devices. I want to talk about the identity of the person behind those devices. Mm -hmm. And what are we doing or thinking about, or are we thinking about uh, what those devices that are out there in the world being connected to an individual? You mentioned monetizing data. So what does that mean? If we're going to monetize the data, do we need to know about who the person is? How are we connecting that information? And should there be a framework associated with what are best practices in dealing with identity in a completely connected world? So I'd be curious your thoughts on that. If only we had some kind of national strategy for trusted identities in cyberspace. <laughs> yeah, but they're not doing that. <laughs> yeah. uh, but I think the, 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 the work that they're doing is built on what I think is a best practice that's shared, which is to separate uh, certain roles of the identity provider and the relying party and to create whatever you're looking at to foster an ecosystem where you can have different types of identity providers um, that depend on the context. Now, that is fairly straightforward on a whiteboard mock-up. Actually deploying that in an industry is quite tricky, especially when you take away the revenue source of how do we use, of using someone's data. Because plenty of people are willing to step in and say, we will bear the cost of providing identity information and certain authentication services as long as we can watch what's happening and mine that data. Um, if you build, if you start off with a goal of privacy preservation and identity protection as part of that, it gets harder to deploy that kind of system. Mark, what are you thinking about this at uh, FTC? Oh. By the well, way, I've, I've been involved in so many failed authentication efforts that it's become like a personal hobby of mine. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I guess I would just say the way it, it works now, to such a large extent, there's no, there's often no personal information, right? But there's device information that's attributable to sort of a, an unknown user that happens to be me. And then <laughs> all this, and then there are, people behind the scenes who are sort of like sometimes reconnecting that with me or, or connecting that to people who have information about me and then sort of adding it maybe in a sort of like anonymous way to what, what they know about me. Um, so I don't know. I mean, it'll be interesting one day if we sort of have a, an authenticated web and a non-authenticated web. Um, I don't know if that'll ever happen, but um, just for certain types of transactions where, you know, like the, the way that uh, a lot of the newspapers have evolved to sort of having sort of known individuals um, commenting and not just sort of anybody out there commenting anonymously. But. I, I like where you're going with that, and I think a lot of the technology for that actually exists today. Uh, when I uh, log into my uh, stock trading account, when I log into my bank, when I log into the VPN at work, I can authenticate myself with strong multi-factor authentication. In a lot of places you can do this, strong multi-factor authentication even without a password, uh, where you have strong device-based authentication in your mobile device, and you have biometric confirmation that it's, it's really you, uh, and you put those two things together and you're trying to do something over here on, on your laptop and it's asking you over here, are you trying to uh, log into your uh, stock trading account, you're trying to log into your VPN, and you have multi-factor corroboration on that. You type a username, no password, and you have strong device auth and strong biometric auth, and no 
passwords. I, I think that technology exists today, and it's being uh, deployed in a number of use cases. I wish I could remember the uh, great author who once said the future is already here, it just isn't evenly distributed. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think for the end of the password, I, I think that future is, is here, and it's just not evenly distributed yet. And I'm really relieved after a decade of wanting that future. I, I think that is, by the way, one of the goals of the administration's final effort on uh, cybersecurity is to get rid of the password, which I think a lot of us have felt was inadequate now for perhaps 20 years. but. Uh, anyhow, Malika. I think this is still involved in space from a legislative perspective. I think it's also something to look at closely and, and in a lot of cases where expert agencies are much better placed to, to work with uh, industry groups to come up with solutions. Is authentication kind of the flip side of who owns the data? Because if, if you authenticate yourself as the owner of the data, that has implications for what you can do with it. And is it the individual who owns the device is it the device manufacturer? Is it a third party? How do we think about authentication in the data ownership context? Well, I, I think about authentication both in a user authentication perspective in terms of how do I authenticate myself to the cloud-based services that are driving a bunch of devices as well as a bunch of other cloud-based services as well as a bunch of other relying parties. So there's the user auth side of it. But the devices also need to authenticate themselves both to each other and, and to us. And for that, that's where we're working with manufacturers. And we're not alone in this, but I think one of the better approaches is to work with the manufacturers of these devices and the chip makers to build the credentials into the device so that wherever that chip or that device goes anywhere in the world, it can represent certain information about itself, often with hardware-backed security and a global you know, trusted brand and key management uh, for making sure that that information is still accurate and hasn't been revoked for good reason. OK. Uh, we had uh, we have two and three. We got three questions. One, two, three. Okay, go ahead. So the individual and the. Thank you, Jeroen from First Netherlands Embassy. Um, this morning I attended a session that Jim was talking about about encryption and. I wasn't the... going to blow your cover. <laughs> <laughs> and that that huge developments uh, on the field of encryption and the, the way new encryption techniques are open to the public. Um, when you look at this problem, isn't this a problem that basically solves itself? When you look at, at, at all these rapid developments in encryption, why can't the industry just adapt these techniques in their, in their, uh, in their new products? And if, if they do, well, is, is this a problem that's part of the problem there is right now? Is that a problem that's part of the fact that uh, right now we're in the pioneering age of uh, the Internet of Things? That's the first question. The second one is, um, when, it's for some reason, uh, it's necessary for Congress or for Parliament to, to impose regulations, wouldn't that be um, blocking uh, innovation in a, in, a, in, a, in a terrible way and, well, uh, lead, leads, us, or leads us to the hands of the big industries, basically? So I'll, I'll go back to the, the first question, which is, you know, why isn't this a, a problem that's just simply solving itself? And in a lot of cases, I come back to the, the awareness. Uh, when I talk about these extremely constrained devices being able to do powerful crypto, the, the most common pushback I get back on that is, and this is from good engineers, very good software engineers, very good security engineers, that say, wait a minute, there's no way that this device with only 10K of static RAM or 2K of static RAM, just extremely limited resources, can run even the OpenSSL uh, library. And they're absolutely right. They can't run that library, but there are other libraries for doing elliptic curve, like the nano implementation of elliptic curve that can run in less than 2K of static RAM, and the uh, micro implementation that can run in less than 10K. And so they're right that the library which they know can't run in that extremely constrained devices, but there are other libraries that they don't know about. And that's what I mean by there's just not awareness on what technologies are available to deliver security in these extremely constrained devices. So that's, that's one part of it. Uh, for the, the regulatory question, I'll step back, though, and let my esteemed colleagues field that one. Maybe just to add, though, on the first question, I think the other challenge, in the clients he's talking to are, are large companies with security teams. Again, I think an important point to remember with IoT is there are a lot of people connecting things to the internet that have never been in the tech business before that don't have these security teams and may not understand what encryption is, um, which is also not the only solution as part of the whole um, cybersecurity chain, right? The, not just encryption. So I think that's a really important challenge for as people connect more things, how do we get them to understand what cybersecurity, cyber hygiene is? And one, also, of the, one of the, go ahead, I'm sorry. I was just going to also add that I'd rather a device not be encrypted and have everyone know it 
than to say, oh, we found a developer. He knows crypto. He knows web crypto. <laughs> so we're just going to have him, hey, here's a library. You found it on GitHub. Just roll this out, because it has to be encrypted. That is, that is worse than having something that has no protection at all. Um, and when you start to sort of think about, it, it is easy to sort of build a toy model of saying this will authenticate to that, and that will authenticate to that. But then you start to say, all right, well, how many suppliers make products that, are part, that go into my final device? Uh, what needs to be built in? How far up the supply chain? And by the way, my competitor, who also uses a third, we have a third overlap, has a completely different ar architecture. So I'm going to ask this supplier to try to implement all these things properly. Uh, it's not impossible, but it becomes a very complicated issue that unless you have a clear market demand to solve, you're not going to see solved. I, I will say I was in uh, Palo Alto on uh, Thursday, uh, and one of the issues that came up was a fear among these were startups that uh, adding requirements, liability, whatever, would actually degrade their ability to innovate, that it would add costs to them. And so this is a social question. You want to add cost for security and privacy, but you may see uh, uh, a degradation of your ability to innovate. At least that's what they said. So I think, Malika, you've been talking about that. How do you safeguard against that? I think there's also opportunities, and we've seen it in the tech industry for years, opportunities mm -hmm. to innovate based on more security and based on more privacy options. And so, um, again, I think the focus for, sure. for the work we've done is not to prevent them from innovating mm -hmm. and learning first, but I'd also push back a little bit on the notion that if you want to do privacy by design or security by design, you're also limiting your, your potential. I, I'm not sure that's true. Sure, right. cars are a classic example, which is that uh, the, the you, you, people say this all the time now, but when the uh, three big car manufacturers were first told that they had to install seat belts in congressional hearings considering that legislation, they all said it would be the death of the American auto industry. And of course, what we see now is that they innovate to make their cars more secure. So there's no rule requiring, someone told me this, actually in Palo Alto, there's no law that requires you to install airbags uh, but there, is, there, there are laws for passive restraints. But the desire to compete by innovating in security has, has created incentives, internal incentives or market incentives. So I think for startups, anything that slows time to market is often a showstopper. Mm -hmm. um, but that's why I go back to security as an enabler. If you build in a secure over-the-air update mechanism, it'll let you safely and securely push out new functionality to your customers faster. And all of a sudden, you can innovate faster, which is very much in line with sort of the lean startup you know, approach that many of these smaller companies are taking. And I think your emphasis on the smaller company is mm -hmm. spot on. I mean, some of the top analysts in this space say that within three years, more than half of the IoT solutions will come from companies less than three years old. Uh, so if, if we can't, as a community, if we can't deliver security to these smaller companies and make it easy for them to consume, this is one of the reasons why we've been participating in a number of open source efforts to make security very easy to consume. Um, I, I think we need to. Okay, we had uh, a question over there. Uh, hi, Brian Smith with Beacon Global Strategies. Um, as we move from these devices increasingly connected to the internet to where they're going to be increasingly connected to each other, that will probably be through 5G wireless. So my question is, what can be done as we develop standards for 5G to enable, facilitate security solutions for that true internet of things? Most of the vast majority of devices around the internet of things are connecting over a shorter range, uh, you know, a Bluetooth, Wi-Fi. Uh, Zigbee, Z-Wave, uh, short range uh, communication. So it's actually only a minority of the devices that actually have a cellular modem, be it you know, 3G, 4G, or some of the coming 5G standards. Um, and in that context, one of the things that I encourage engineers to do is to recognize all of the underlying uh, network uh, communication protocols as untrusted, recognize them as untrusted. You cannot put stock in the security of those networks that you, you don't control. You should build your crypto uh, at a higher layer, whether it's uh, TLS, DTLS, uh, DTLS in constrained environments such as DICE, uh, or you're doing the encryption and the signing at a data object layer, um, uh, not trusting the transport layer security at all. Uh, you, know, you, you should build security sort of assuming uh, that 
some of those lower layer transport protocols and link layer protocols have uh, not always reliably delivered on the security promises that they made. Uh, because, you know, looking back over time, you know, there have been a lot of disappointments when people put a lot of stock into the security of those lower layer protocols and then vulnerabilities were discovered. And so one way to avoid that situation is build in security at a higher layer and just consider the, uh, the network communications at the lower layer to be untrusted. Now, there's some things that you really need out of the network, like availability, um, uh, you know, mitigation of uh, denial of service uh, attacks, but that availability is a very different property than, uh, than a confidentiality or an integrity property. Well, uh, we didn't even talk about Spectrum, uh, in part, it's just too hard for, uh, for us, and in part because um, we probably wouldn't have had time to work through it. It's a different set of expertise, a different set of market drivers. But it is one of the issues that comes up in the Internet of Things. I think the range issue is worth paying attention to because if you have to stand next to a device uh, in order to hack it, it changes some of the risk profile. It's something to think about when you th start thinking about how you manage risk. I want to see if there are any final questions from the audience. This is your last chance. Okay, if not, I'm going to go down the road with the panelists and ask if they have any concluding thoughts. Oh, I'm sorry, we had one in the back. Hi, my name is Cindy Pask. I'm from the Council of Scientific Society Presidents. Thank you all, it's been a great discussion. Um, the one issue that has, was touched upon but not really explored that, that comes to my mind is the human element because so much of what goes on is, happens because of the human element, no matter how much security you build into these, there's somebody that's looking for a way to undermine that security. And where do you see that as an area that is being explored, and where's the educational component that, that possibly comes along with that? And um, when you talked about the, the, the authentication, what happens to that? that piece of equipment when it gets lost? So um, when, when I think about those very sophisticated adversaries that are extremely well resourced that we're up against, I, I really think we have to uh, build in what we call sort of the four cornerstones of security. Protect the communications, protect the devices, manage lots of devices over time because security is constantly moving and, and so are the adversaries. But then no matter how well you do those first three cornerstones, you need an analytics capability that can sift through all of the security telemetry and look for that really sophisticated adversary that will just leave you know, footprints in the sand without tripping any alarms in a really locked down environment. You have to sift through all of that security data to find those footprints in the sand and find and fight that, that adversary. Um, so that's how we think about the, the, the sophisticated adversaries. There was a second question, though. Yeah, if it's reported lost or stolen, uh, or the key compromised in any way, uh, you know, if you have a good certificate authority, they, they should have a way to sort of revoke the validity of that, that certificate. So that if somebody comes sort of bearing that device, you know, it, it, uh, it, it you know, it, it can be, you, you do a lookup on that device, you know, it's, it's showing lost or stolen. So, yeah, I think that is part, any good, robust, widespread, uh, key management system should have the ability to you know, renew, repudiate, et cetera. The problem is every new feature you add to that uh, increases the cost, increases the amount of communication, increases a reliance on a trusted third party, or if you're doing it decentralized, really increases the cost and power. Uh, so there are solutions to all of these uh, problems. These have been, they're well understood. Uh, but every new feature you add increases complexity, uh, which increases cost, and it increases risk. Mark, were you going to add something? Well, I was just going to say that um, going back to your point earlier, um, I think the, as to the human element, the demands on the individual to secure something or take some secure action should be extremely, extremely low. I mean, I think of my mother who um, is literally afraid to use a computer and does not. Um, but also, if you have a business of 200 people, so if your security depends on the security of the one or two people in that enterprise who care the least about security, then you're really in trouble. Um, so, you know, I think it's just gotta, gotta work. Malika, we'll give you the last word. Well, that's what, that's what our focus has been on the human element, is really how do individuals 
easily implement these solutions or don't have to implement at all, right? And, and also, how do small companies who are participating in IoT can do this fairly easily? Um, so that's been really the focus of, of how we look at some of these things. Great. Well, please join me in thanking our panel for this discussion. Thank you. Oh, oops. Before you run away. Are we still?